I've seen that so much in Russia. People who are drawn towards the crowd, drawn towards Putin, four drinks in, hate that guy. And these things are completely related. Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia, and dedicated to the proposition first articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that a strong and balanced foreign policy is the necessary shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman, a counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a Bulwark contributor, and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center. And I'm rejoined this week by my partner in all things strategery, Elliot Cohen, the Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategy at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy at the Center for Strategic International Studies. Elliot, welcome back. Well, it's uh, good to be here. And I must say, I'm particularly looking forward to having a session dealing with sneakiness, smut, Putin, Trump, and Nazis. You can't get much better than that. Our, our special guest is Peter Pomerantsev, a British journalist, author, and television producer. Uh, Peter was born in the Soviet Union, but emigrated at a very early age to the United Kingdom, where he was educated at Edinburgh University. He's now a senior fellow at the SNF Agora Institute at the Johns Hopkins School of uh, Johns Hopkins University. I'm sorry, um, and author of three very good books, all of which I have read. Uh, Nothing is true and everything is possible about his misadventures in reality TV in the early part of the century in Russia. This is not propaganda and how to win an information war, the propagandist who outwitted Hitler. Peter, welcome to Shield of the Republic. Thank you for having me. The book is really terrific. It's a rip roaring story. And I have to confess, as I have told you in the green room, that despite having uh read a lot about World War II and written my own PhD dissertation on World War II, I somehow had completely missed the story of Sefton Delmar and the uh, Delmar and the covert propaganda he directed at, uh, at Nazi Germany during World War II. Tell us about the story of Sefton Delmar and, and how did you come upon it? How did you decide to write about him? Um, Sefton Delmar um, was a remarkably a remarkable journalist, first and foremost, who covered the rise of the Nazis in the 1920s. And he had this incredible gift for impersonation. He actually impersonated the head of the stormtroopers adjutant, uh, his assistant to penetrate a stormtrooper rally. And he, um, uh, he saw the rise of the Nazis close up. Um, he managed to persuade the Nazis to allow him to accompany Hitler on Hitler's famous air tours around hysterical Nazi rallies in the 20s. And, and he had an incredible understanding of how Nazi propaganda worked. And when the war started, he became head eventually after quite a few trials and tribulations, the head of covert propaganda for the British political warfare executive. So if overt were things like the BBC, um, covert were things which were sneakier and smuttier, as Elliot said. Um, and at his peak, he was running dozens of radio stations uh, across occupied Europe, but especially Germany. Stations which purported to be Nazi stations, but actually were subverting the Nazis. Um, you've got to say all sides were doing something like this in the Second World War. Actually, Goebbels pioneered this, creating stations in Britain that claimed to be British workers stations or British um, Scottish nationalist stations. Um, so that wasn't the innovative part. The innovative part was what Delman did with his stations, which was fairly revolutionary. Say more. So, I mean, I have to say more. I wrote a 270 page book, <laughs> but um, the reason I, I decided to write the book was when, as I was researching Delman, like somebody who studies disinformation, he's the sort of person that you bump into eventually when you, when you traverse the history of it. Um, he, it turned out from like 1943 onwards, so the peak of his work, he wanted his listeners to know that the British were behind these stations. So it wasn't deception. He was doing something else. He was giving people cover. He was creating a space and an environment in which people could tell their bosses, tell the Gestapo that they're actually listening to a Nazi, to a Nazi station when it's not. And more importantly, could tell themselves that they weren't actually being um, disloyal to their country, um, a sort of consensual self-deception. 
And he was creating this sort of masquerade under which he could reveal the truth because beneath the, the sort of the, the, the mask, um, his radios were amazing for the amount of incredibly visceral de detail they gave about Germans' real lives, uh, about the corruption of the Nazi party, about the sufferings of soldiers on the front, about the, the, you know, about what life was like on the home front. So he gave all this unvarnished truth um, about life in Nazi Germany, life, like the lives of soldiers, the lives of, of submarine, um, uh, of people manning the submarines, but all under this mask. And, and th th there's lots of layers there uh, about what he was trying to achieve with this, but, but I was also just incredibly intrigued by this idea that you could only reveal truth under a mask, that you needed a mask within which to create an environment where truth became possible again. But that's, 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 that's maybe the thing that grabbed me. But, but once we get into the details like we will today, he was doing so many innovative, wacky, wrong, and sometimes probably very stupid things as well. So I, um, you know, it's really a remarkable book, Peter, because the book is obviously primarily about Stefan Delmer, political warfare executive. Uh, but it's also a book with a lot of reflections about Vladimir Putin's Russia and even some about contemporary American politics. And I think uh, in the hands of a less gifted uh, and thoughtful writer, that would seem forced and it does not seem forced. Um, I, if I could, I'd like to just dwell on Sefton Delmer for a little bit. I think the one of the things that's interesting, maybe you could, we can draw you out a bit on this, is if you look at uh, some of these radios like uh, the Soldaten Center, so this is, these are kind of nominally um, angry German soldiers. It, it was not black propaganda in the sense of we're going to pretend to be the opposition to Hitler broadcasting from within Germany, and which, and in a way, that was what the Germans were trying to do to the Brits, too. You know, we are the, the Scottish nationalists, even though they're actually uh, uh, based in Germany. No, the idea here is that you pretend to basically be supportive of the regime at some level, but you're just angry because of the corruption and you know, and some depravity and, and all that, um, which is quite an interesting way to do it. And I wonder if you could talk about that. And I think if you could also, there's a very dark side to this too, where they are deliberately putting out messages, for example, to try to get people to commit suicide. So the suicide one, which shocked me so much that I put it in the book, um, to be clear, that was, there was actually a whole, the British had a whole rumors department in Second World War, uh, Sibs, Sibilare from the Latin, um, that, that was um, churning out stories, uh, stories about weapons that the British didn't have to, you know, which would be spread through their networks in Germany. Um, so, and one of the rumors they put out were meant to stimulate suicidal thoughts. Um, Delma wasn't actually, as far as I can tell, that wasn't Delma. I mean, I was going through the PWE files and the, the file for rumors is right next to the file for uh, covert propaganda radio. Uh, they're different files. Um, they would actually take a lot from the the SIBs and put them out, a lot from the rumors and put it out. But but I, I don't I have no, you know, I haven't read anywhere they put that one out. But the British were doing lots of stuff, which A, I'm not entirely sure how effective it was. I mean, the way they do it, the theory was, um, you know, they, they were attempting this early version of what we call behavioral change now, um, was that if you tell stories about suicide, that'll get people more inclined that way incredibly dark. I mean, and there's a point when I come across this archive in the book and I catch my breath. I mean, that was my feeling when I read it. I was, I was shocked. And then I reflect on being shocked and, you know, compared to Hiroshima or firebombing Dresden, should I be shocked? You know, why are we more shocked at an information op, which is definitely has a, you know, is trying to have a very, very evil effect compared to, you know, you know, firebombing Dresden and the, like these massive bombardments of civilians. So, so, but also I remember discovering that in the archives and archives do that to you, Elliot, as you know, you sometimes come across something, you're like, what <laughs> did I just read? Um, but then there was doing many other very, very amoral things. Um, he was definitely trying to um, talk about, this is very early stuff, by the way, this is when he's still sort of really experimenting. If, if we get into the darkness, he was trying to, get uh, Germans to sort of get into these sort of um, tranquilizers essentially by doing stories that SS and Gestapo were really into, um, I don't know what it would be called today, sort of Xanaxes, 
or something and and through that hoping that more people would take them so the german public would become more soporific um and and even you know even more than that he would um he would um he would write letters or his team would write letters to grieving parents in germany who couldn't admit that their kids um had died and he would write letters to them saying oh actually you know little little torsten or uh little whatever uh Helmut is actually now in Britain living a wonderful life. Make sure you tell all the neighbors how great stuff is in Britain. Um, so um, those were deeply immoral things. Uh, and he has the moral courage to talk about them in his memoir and say he's ashamed of it. He feels ashamed of it. Um, and um, in the book, I have him as very much a, a character who's full of darkness and light, both personally and in his work. And the lessons that we can draw are both positive and negative. Um, this is a book of lights of, you know, it's funny, like we, 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 we transitioned ourselves, didn't we? From like, ha, 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 smut, you know, action against the Nazis. Then very quickly, you get into a very, very dark place, which is as it should be, because we're talking about the Second World War. So just um, um, thank you for that. Let me just, again, ask you to talk a little bit about the, this idea of pretending to be within the system and basically alle uh, have allegiance to it. I'm, as, if I, as I remember the book, you say, you know, including some anti-Semitic tropes uh, to kind of prove your bona fides, but then putting out lots of stuff, which is designed to demoralize people because you're showing just how corrupt the senior leadership is. So the, you know, and particularly the idea of sort of soldiers who are still loyal to the, uh, to the military ideal and just furious at the Nazi elite, which was actually very corrupt. So that was that was a long running theme. So, you know, what the I mean, it's, it's very important to understand sort of what he's countering. The Nazis, of course, want to destroy and this is their official propaganda aim to destroy the old social categories, um, destroy the old loyalties and replace them with membership in a Nazi folk underneath the Fuhrer. That's meant to be your new community. Um, and what Delmer, of course, is doing is saying, actually, the Nazis, he calls them the Partei Kommune, comes up with a word for them saying, this is a, you know, a cult unto itself. They're only interested in their own well-being. And you, German Catholics, German soldiers, uh, German or Bavarians, whatever, all these different other identities that you have, that is what you, you know, those loyalties and those bonds are more important. And, and in a sense, what he understood, and he understood it, really from his own life, is that people do need community. People do need for better or worse to be part of a group. And it's very few that will be brave enough to stand up to the Nazis and be dissidents and, and or today, you know, stand up to Putin. Most people are, I mean, if you want to be unkind, conformist. And um, he knew that because he'd experienced it himself. Uh, he was honest enough to say that he was very influenced by propaganda as a child and wanted to be part of a group. And, and he was very aware of that, that, that if you're going to demolish the Nazi folk, there has to be something else. And his programs are constantly stressing those other loyalties, those other bonds and those other, uh, those other group identities. That's to me, actually, Peter, one of the uh, really powerful elements of the book, uh, which is uh, when uh, you recount Delmer's approach to uh, propaganda, uh, and this goes to Eliot's last question. Um, it's rooted in the notion that uh, you can't just appeal to their better natures. This is not just a, a an effort to say, you know, uh, look how terrible the Nazis are. You don't have rule of law anymore. You don't have democracy. You don't have all these high flown ideals that we have here in England. Instead, it's an appeal to, uh, you know, to to uh, I don't want to say baser instincts, but to more directly personal instincts uh, like survival or uh, envy at the, um, the cor you know, corrupt uh, lifestyles of, uh, of the, um, of what in uh, Soviet context would have been called the nomenclatura. Um, it, 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 and this is really Navalny too, right? I mean, Navalny gets criticized for uh, appealing to nationalism when he was first starting out. Uh, and, but relentlessly focuses 
on the fact that the you know regime is a you know regime of uh, you know the, as he calls it the party of crooks and and thieves. Um, so I'm I'm curious a, a, about that element. If you could talk about it a little bit, and then one other question I I would ask you to uh, tell us about. Delmer is extremely effective at doing this, at, at being able to uh, appeal to these instincts because he knows the Nazis essentially from the uh, inside out. As you said earlier, he had covered them as a journalist. But even before that, as a young man, his, his father was trapped uh, in uh, Germany, with English professor teaching in university in Germany during World War I. Uh, he's trapped. His father's interned. He's really bilingual uh, from, um, you know, from um, from an early age. And so uh, he doesn't really fit in, in in Germany as a student during World War One. And when he goes back to the United Kingdom after the war, he doesn't really fit in. Uh, he's always a little bit of another. And I wonder whether in in writing about Delmer or telling his story, whether you uh, found some echoes in your own personal history of having uh, been an emigre from the Soviet Union, grown up in the United Kingdom, returned uh, to Russia, bilingual, et cetera, and therefore maybe find, you know, uh, speaking to a Russian audience more accessible than others might. Yeah, I mean, um, I found, and that's the second reason I decided to write the book. The first one was when I realized Delmer was doing something quite fascinating with with his with his covert propaganda, and the second one was when I realized that there was a really strong echo there. I think my fascination with propaganda doesn't come because it's my third book now, so so clearly this is a thing I'm interested in. Um, it, I'm not actually that interested in technology, you know. I, I'm interested in it, but not amazingly so. So. It's not as if, you know, there's a lot of people get into propaganda because they're fascinated by the technology. I'm not even that interested by posters and all the kind of imagery of propaganda. I know I don't, you know, there's no, I don't have like loads of Soviet propaganda posters in my, in my home. Um, even though this room is particularly red, it was this way before we moved in. Um, um, I'm fascinated by propaganda, of what it tells us about identity and what it tells us about um, knowing when you're yourself and knowing when you've been playing roles which have been created by, by others or by society. And when you grow up bilingual, when you grow up moving countries as a kid, which both myself and Seft and Delma did, you become very aware of how you transform in those different contexts. I mean, I think we're all aware of this. I think this is, you know, every teenager knows this because they're, you know, they're playing with roles all the time. Um, but if you move around countries and languages as a child, as a young child, especially, you become very sensitive to it. Um, and when I saw him describing that childhood, I, I saw so many echoes and how that then relates to what is interesting about propaganda. Delma's big, he never theorizes it, but he writes in his memoirs, it's really one theme, which is about how propaganda gives people who are confused about their identity satisfying roles to perform. Yeah, he describes the Nazis as a cabaret, a cabaret that then wants to get rid of all other cabarets. It's sort of like, you know, this is the only cabaret in town and, you know, they shut out the cabaret very quickly, but they themselves are cabaret. They're giving people roles to perform that are satisfying because they tap into people's desire for superiority, supremacism, sadism. I mean, Delma has a pretty dark view of human nature. Um, he's interested. So firstly, they give people emotional satisfaction, but then they give them ways of being and ways of knowing who they are in a complicated world. Um, and there's so many echoes with our contemporary world. Where we're also going through, you know, a very cabaret like time, a little bit like, you know, the 1920s, huge social change, all sorts of identities and assumptions that we have of everything from gender to nationality to social classes in a similar period of tumult. And, and in this sort of context, some people, many people maybe, are, are drawn to a propaganda that satisfies emotional cravings and gives you a role to perform, which is very simple and very appealing. 
And we can get really into the complexities of why it's appealing, you know, the way it allows you to cast out everything you don't like about yourself and project it onto others. You know, we can go on and on. And Dylan was very, very good at subverting that as well. But that's Delma's view of life. Delma never thinks there's a true you. So one of the characters in Delma's life in my book who just hangs in the background, and he just hangs in the background of my book, I don't really force him onto the avant-scene, is Max Reinhardt, who is the most important sort of theatre impresario of the age. He revolutionises acting. Um, Delma goes to his plays as a child. Um, Reinhardt's sort of dramaturg is, is the father of his best friend. So he spends his childhood going to his plays. He watches him again in the 1920s when he's back in Berlin. He references him quite often. Then he has people from Reinhardt's theatre working in his cabaret, in his counter-propaganda cabaret. And Max Reinhardt was very, very interesting. Reinhardt believed that all life is theatre. He was famous for setting his plays in the middle of the city, in cathedrals, a train station. So you'd be going through a train station and the play would be playing out around you. He thought, he thought all life was theatre, but he thought that there was two ways of acting. One is when you imitate others. Yeah? When you try to, as an actor, study the personality and try to be like them. What he wanted his actors to do is say, look for things in yourself to pour into the role. Yeah? And there's almost a theory of how to live there. You know? uh, I think Delma would say that you're always playing a role. An Englishman, an English schoolboy, a journalist. He was very, very aware of that he was performing being a journalist. But you can either imitate others when you do that. And that's when propaganda works. The propagandist gives you roles and they then say what that role is. You are an assess man. You are a, uh, an Aryan. This is the role and we define what it means. And at the end of the day, it means that you're going to go and die for us. Or you can start inhabiting and transforming and reinventing these roles yourself or other roles. And those ones are pretty hard to reinvent. He's always aware that we have many selves, that we can be many different people. You know? And then even those who seem to be committed to their role as a German patriot in World War I have another role they can play as a school teacher or as a father. And you can draw people away from the propagandized role to the other ones they play in life. So all the world's a stage, but the way you play it is where the tension rises. And sorry for the very long answer, but that's really, I find that, I find that, I don't know, I found that resonated with me. You know, it's particularly interesting, uh, given our era where there's sometimes a push for a kind of identitarian politics, where, where people, which is sort of monist. You have only one identity as, you know, pick an ethnic or religious minority or as a woman or a man or whatever. And uh, I think Delmer was on to something by understanding that actually people are a lot more complicated than that. It, it, what might be a bit of a digression, I want to um, dig a little bit more into the, his the context in which he's operating. I think one of the things that's fascinating is, you know, as Eric was saying, he grows up in Germany um, before the World War One, then during World War One, um, and he does sort of move back and forth effortlessly. Although at the end of his life, you point out he really kind of styles himself an English gentleman, uh, living living in the country. And the, of course, one thought that I had, Eric, is comparing this with some of the Russian emigres uh, that we used to use for things like Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, where you, you were taking emigres, okay? They were still Russians uh, broadcasting back to their uh, compatriots, but they never really confused themselves saying, no, I'm actually an English gentleman uh, now, um, but I'm, I'm also kind of half half Russian. So he he is this his own identity is somewhat ambiguous. He's a very colorful figure. I mean, the story about him as a journalist are uh, quite amazing. And here's the question for you, having grown up in the UK. I, I find it remarkable that the Brits, not just in this case, but in lots of other cases during the war with some special warfare units, with their intelligence community, um, with their politics, were willing to bring in all kinds of odd characters and give them play. And it's, it's actually a question for you, Peter, but also a question for you, Eric. The question for you, Peter, is, is this something that you think is kind of innate to the UK and to British culture, that it's, which is, after all, a, quite a theatrical culture in many ways, which people are playing roles 
all the time uh, that made it easier for them to do this. And Eric, just use your, you know, reflect on your experience dealing with things that are not quite as um, incredible as this, but, you know, where, where we do try to do some of these sorts of things uh, to other people, I think not quite as successfully and who we are willing to recruit and who we are willing to give free reign to do some pretty wild stuff. So maybe you start with you, Peter, and then over to Eric. Um, I think that it, my sense of World War II, and, and I'm not a I'm not a historian. I'm somebody who's plumbing history to try to understand today. Um, and I caveat that very strongly at the start of the book. Um, my sense is the British. You've got to remember this is 1940-41. I mean, you know, this is Delma starts broadcasting before um, Hitler's attack on the Soviet Union. This is you know. The Nazis are ruling Europe. Britain is genuinely under threat. We don't know if the Americans are going to enter the war yet. So I think it was just throw them all in. <laughs> it was desperation. Throw them all in. Cabaret artists, yep. <laughs> like, you know, classic scholars, yep. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> one-eyed pirates, go for it. Let's try the one-eyed pirates. I think, you know, there's a second story to tell about the chaos. Um, maybe the very creative and productive chaos of you know, the special operations of executive, the Ministry of Information, the BBC, um, which are just full of nonstop um, sort of people just doing what the hell they wanted and <laughs> telling the cabinet office to sod off. Because I just think it was all backs against the wall and everybody was just ripping at the sinews. And, you know, even the really sort of dodgy and amoral and probably counter effective things that Delma did that we discussed earlier. Um, You've got to put it in context. This is like 1940, 1941. I mean, this is, you know, you're talking about your country in an existential risk. Um, and at that point, you just try everything. You know, Elliot, I think uh, your question would be better directed to our Johns Hopkins colleague, John McLaughlin, who is a, you know, a much more serious historian of American intelligence than, than I am. I, you know, I do think at the outset of, um, I mean, so first of all, uh, Americans have a kind of very ambivalent attitude towards intelligence, uh, which I think is quite different from the Brits. I mean, you know, Henry Stimson, American uh, you know, Secretary of State and then later Secretary of War in FDR's cabinet, famously said in the in the 1930s, you know, gentlemen don't read other gentlemen's mail. Uh, you know, we don't really establish an intelligence service until really the, in the midst of World War II when FDR asks Wild Bill Donovan to do it. And in those early years, I would say, under Donovan, and then um, after the OSS, the successors, uh, uh, the early CIA, um, I think there was more tolerance for eccentricity uh, than there is now. Um, and I think that's also, I mean, I think Britain has always had more of a tolerance for eccentrics than Americans, which are much more conformist culture. So uh, again, I mean, John would be a better, you know, source than I, but I, I think that you have put your finger on a kind of cultural differentiator between you know, two people who Churchill said famously were separated by a common language. Yeah. I mean, it, it, because it's true in the, across the board in the British experience of World War II. I mean, you just, you know, the characters at Bletchley Park are extraordinary. Uh, and, you know, they were willing to, and it may just have been that it was a crisis. It was also, it was a less bureaucratized time. And, uh, you know, these many of these formal organizations were far less developed than they subsequently became. Although, as you casually mentioned, Peter, in the book, there's, the British continued a version of the political warfare executive. Uh, I think under the, the the initials were IRD was the International Research Department or something like that, which did some of the early Cold War propaganda and uh, in in the Soviet Union. I I don't know a whole lot about it. You you probably can uh, can illuminate that for us. Um, actually, no, I, I do know um, um, there's, there's, there's people writing history about now. A lot of that stuff has been declassified recently. So there was a whole uh, story to that and it continues into sort of the invasion of Iraq and, and Middle Eastern things. Um, I mean, 
uh, and even before that into into the first Gulf War, I think. So um, and the Falklands, there's there's some stuff about how British using kind of radio stations in the Falklands War. Um, but no, it continues throughout the Cold War. I think Rory Cormack is a professor at Nottingham University who specializes on this. And I think he's even writing a book about this. So there's lots more to come out. I think, you know, because we're now fascinated again by propaganda, fake news, disinformation, I think that always becomes a touchstone for looking back into history. So I've been looking at Delma. I'm sure others will look at the Cold War. There's lots to re-explore. So the last question I want to ask on World War II and and throw things back to Eric. Uh, it was all fascinating. And, you know, you, you kind of chuckle at some of the things that they do. You're appalled at some of the other things that uh, that they do. The question is, do you think it really made any tangible difference? Uh, or is that even something you were, you were investigating in terms of willingness of the Germans to surrender? Because, uh, you know, as you point out, the Germans fought to the bitter end on this one, uh, unlike World War I, where there's a collapse uh, and they, you know, they sue for an armistice. Um, in this case, you know, right down to the last streets of Berlin, they were fighting. So as much as we're intrigued by all this, how do you measure the effect? Um, so, yeah, it, that's a very good question, Elliot. And and one that I dedicate almost two chapters to in the book to try to really unpick. Um, I mean, in terms of fighting, they did surrender much more on, on the Western Front. Um, so there is a difference there. I'm not saying that Delma's work was a huge part of that, um, but there are, there's anecdotal evidence that it was. But let's break down how we might think about it um, at all, because really distilling the effects of any kind of communications campaign is very, very hard, even when you have sort of liberatorial control groups and stuff. It's very, very hard to work out what is the uh, influence of, of media and communication, um, you know, there's that famous advertising sort of um, uh, the famous uh, advertising anecdote, I guess, like we know that half of advertising doesn't work. We just don't know which half. Um, and, you know, communication scholars will tell you how, how hard it is to, to, to work out the influence of things. But here's the data points that they had, because they had a few. Um, so the British were doing surveys of POWs all the time. So in terms of engagement, by the end of the war, they found about 40% of German soldiers were listening to these radios. That is amazing, just, just engagement-wise. I know engagement doesn't mean effect, but that 40% are tuning in. I mean, if we had 40% of Russian soldiers listening to something we were creating, we would be very, very, you know, very happy with ourselves. Um, so on the level of engagement, you have that. Yeah, you have other ind indicators. You have the, you know, the, we have some of the sort of inside uh, Nazi uh, reactions to this. And so the head of the SS in Munich writing to Goebbels going, my God, we have a crisis. One of the top three listened to stations is one of Delmer's sender de, uh, so the Soldaten sender Calais. And um, so, you know, that's, that's a data point where the Nazis themselves are saying it's causing havoc. We need to do something about it. There's, you know, you know, various correspondence and, and talks given by Goebbels and, and his propaganda heads, both internally and externally on this topic. Then you get into the more kind of qualitative stuff, I suppose you could call it that, which is sort of various anecdotes, frankly, of the effects that the radios had on people. Um, and there you're into kind of these stories, which, which indicate something bigger. Um, various soldiers surrendering and saying, I did it because of, because, because of what I heard on the radios. Um, some very, very colorful um, anecdotes like that. Um, other ones are um, the Valkyria rebellion, the sort of the 19, the sort of the late war attempt to stage a sort of coup d'etat, I guess, against, against Hitler by the German army. So the leaders of that, um, according to people who were part of the plot, but then defected to the British, they were inspired by the radios in a very strange way. They knew the British were behind the radios, but they thought, okay, the British are really invested into, uh, the British are really invested into cleaving or creating a cleavage between the army and the party. If we do a, a rebellion, in the name of the army against the party, the British are bound to join in, which the British did not, by the way, even though Delman really wanted the British to do it. But again, that's a very strange kind of effect. I mean, if, I mean it's really anecdotal stuff. The head of the Reichsradio tells Delma that people in 
Del- in Hitler's bunker was so convinced that somebody was leaking information to Delma because the quality and accuracy of the stories on the radios was so good that they started interrogating and looking for uh, who was to blame and, and hauling people in. So look, that's an array of different data points, each of which tell us something. Um, Delma was always modest for a man who was, I think, instinctively not always modest. Um, he was modest for an immodest guy. Um, and he um, was, you know, he played it down. He said, look, his job was to help the military and economic warfare. And at the end of the day, that's, that's, all, that's all they were. And none of it works. If, if, if the war is going badly, there's no propaganda magic to help you. Um, there's another way we can think about effects, about effectiveness, and that's audience, target audience analysis, what we call now, understanding your audience. And there again, parallel to Delma, another guy who has had books written about him, one of my heroes of the World War II is Henry Dix, who was a British psychiatrist, also bilingual, grew up in a German-speaking family in Estonia who was analyzing German soldiers. He's, Henry Dix is incredibly important. I mean, a lot of the stuff you read now from like, I don't know, uh, Jonathan Haidt or something, all this about, you know, there are various types of personalities who are drawn towards authoritarian or conservative ideas by their, you know, by their personality type. A lot of that starts with Henry Dix's analysis of, of, of thousands of German soldiers towards the end of the war. And he does what we call now kind of, I don't know, kind of psychographics, essentially, uh, you know, seeing what are the psychological types. Um, and he's like, 10% are hardcore Nazis who are just completely, you'll never get to them, you know. But then there's a big chunk who are militaristic, like strong father figures, are dangerous for the future of Germany because their instincts are not democratic, um, but have a secret resentment towards the Nazis, which was deeply mixed in with wanting both to be subservient to them. They wanted a leader and then they kind of hated them for it as well. I've seen that so much in Russia. People who are drawn towards the crowd, drawn towards Putin, four drinks in, hate that guy. And these things are completely related. You know, kind of, you know, we don't want to, you know, overanalyze, but it's almost if they hate themselves with the need to, <laughs> the need to, to, to desire a leader. And he said, look, this is a huge part of the audience. And he even uses the same language as Delma, though I don't think they were aware of each other's work talking about how you have to raise their, both of them use the term Schweinehund, raise their inner pig dog, it's a German word, um, raise their, you know, submerged resentments, but always pat- dressing it up in patriotic garb, always very much, you know, creating a, a communal identity. So that's another data point, you know, in the sense that to what extent did Delmar understand his audiences? And he was, he didn't have the sort of big sort of audience survey research that we would use today. He got it. He really understood, especially in his you know, early shows, where he was creating almost these alternatives to um, a Nazi leadership. Um, his, you know, his shows were full of these sort of sweary, violent um, soldiers who were their own types of kind of authoritarian father figures, you could say, but who would turn it around and throw all the mod onto the Nazis instead. Um, we saw that in Russia now with, you know, phenomena like Prigozhin. Um, so, so all those things he got right. Um, and I just think on, a, on an even deeper level, his sense that there is a propaganda that makes you passive and makes you feel good for all the horrible reasons, which is what the Nazis did. Well, his propaganda was trying to make people active um, through self-interest, through in- individualism, through resentment, but active and acting for themselves um, and deciding, actually taking back control of their lives. I mean, he wanted people to defect, to surrender, to run away from the front, to sabotage their ships. He always wanted them to do something. And um, in that sense, I think he caught this tension between sort of passive submission to a strong man and a, a form of thinking and being where you can take back control for real. Peter, I want to uh, read to you a passage that uh, from the book that uh, I think gets at some of what you were just saying in answer to um, to Elliot. It it captures, I think, rather beautifully 
why propaganda works, why, why people are, uh, you know, uh, able to be caught, caught up in, in propaganda. And you write that propagandists across the world and across the ages play on the same emotional notes like well-worn scales. They manipulate the desire to belong, provide a sense of false community to those left feeling deracinated by rapid change, help project our worst feelings about ourselves onto others, allow you to feel special, even superior, and foster the sense that you're surrounded by enemies that want to take something from you, something that's yours and only yours and only you deserve. They play into the yearning for a figure to protect you, tap into or even produce humiliation and then the aggression that makes up for it. At their most effective, they construct whole alternative realities, conspiratorial words where you have no responsibility and many people can be eager to play along with this. I mean, you, you, and this really speaks to um, uh, Hannah Arendt's notion of the annihilation of truth, um, uh, the, the obliteration of the distinction between fact and, and opinion that you write about, you, you cite her. Uh, it's what Steve Bannon would call flooding the zone with shit um, in, in terms of making people uh, unable to, you know, distinguish, uh, you know, reality from uh from a, a political fiction that's useful for someone else's agenda. It, it's really what you wrote about in your first book uh, about the rise of Russian reality TV, uh, which sort of, you know, created this obliteration of the line between, between, uh, you know, fact and, and fiction. And you argue that um, uh, what counter propaganda does, as you were saying earlier, is provide a kind of permission structure for people to think otherwise, to, to, you know, to somehow subvert this sort of capacious, uh, you know, kind of world of, of conspiracy and, and propaganda. H how do we do that with today's Russia and, and with, with Putin? Well, let's start where Delma started from. First is what we don't do. So Delma was very frustrated with the way the Allies were basically trying to preach to Germans. You know, he thought that was a case of what we would call today, I don't know, uh, just being stuck in your own echo chamber and preaching to the converted. So um, he thought that sort of lectures about liberal values just didn't make sense anymore. People were beholden to Hitler because of the things that, that you just quoted there from the book and just, you know, just a, a few were the arguments and a couple of factoids that were not going to make a difference. So you've got to a admit that praying for the overnight emergence of a democratic movement in Russia is probably not where we're at at the moment. What we're at is understanding why people acquiesce to this propaganda or why they enthusiastically support it or where they acquiesce and where they support it and understanding the connections between the leadership and the people and starting to to subvert them. So if tomorrow Russian soldiers were to wake up to a huge new multimedia project, including I think a radio station, because I think radio still is actually quite effective in some ways, that would be targeting Russian soldiers all along the Ukrainian coast, maybe all the way down to Syria, which is telling them, allowing them to listen to it safely by doing the odd speech by, by Putin, or Shoigu or whoever, what, what, what other, whichever, um, you know, grotesque leader is giving a speech that day. And right next to it, you know, Dama would have such a field day today. You know, you'd have the, you know, you'd have quotes from the inbox and the private text messages of not some far off politician, but their local commander and how he's sort of skimming money from their rations by selling it off down the road. And, who is the prostitute he's sleeping with and what VD has she given him? And does his wife know about this? And all this gossip and, well, I wouldn't say rumor, gossip and facts about, you know, about, about them. And that would simultaneously um, help create um, a lack of fear uh, to embolden the soldiers who we know aren't particularly happy. Um, it would cause lots of sort of chaos um, for their leadership. It would start um, 
making everybody in the whole chain of command wonder, hold on, who's leaking this? Where is this information coming from? So something like that, I think tomorrow, if that, if that were to start, I think that makes total sense. You know, that's not preaching to the soldiers. These are soldiers, come on, who are committing war crimes every day and don't seem to care. Um, and much, and much worse. So the idea you're going to, you know, win them over with some sort of moral argumentation is, 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 is just, it's just not going to work. Um, so something like that with the kind of like, um, you know, fun and taboo breaking, uh, content that, uh, Delma had, I think, I think it's a no brainer to do something like that. Um, Ukrainians are doing very fun and inventive things. Um, and I mentioned them in the book, like, like a lot of these things will probably only be told properly after the war. Um, hopefully a war that, that Ukraine wins. Um, but, um, but for something of that size, you actually need a lot of long-term investment. I mean, what Delma was doing, and I keep on coming back to this, we've got to understand the level of research he was putting in to understand the lives of the ordinary soldier and their higher up. Yeah, not Goebbels' private life, but the private life of a sergeant. And the data gathering was remarkable. He'd be told, you know, the, he'd get the latest tidbits from partisan groups. So partisan groups that... that were in contact with, with the British. Um, they would do very, very, again, very amoral things, but very, a lot like the sort of hacks that we see today. Um, they would open the letters of Nazi officials when they wrote abroad. Um, and to make it even creepier, actually, Delma, well, the British Secret Service put microphones everywhere in POW camps so they could listen in to what German soldiers were talking about. That was done for intelligence purposes, but also um, to find out the latest jokes, um, the latest rumors, you know, find out what the soldiers really thought about each other and their superiors. And that gave Delma's material this kind of like spice and immediacy that was, that was legendary. So this incredible effort to find out the details of people's lives, it was, you know, you know, we started talking about how Delma was clearly involved in deception. He overindulged in disinformation. But actually, what made his content so powerful was, was the truth. Um, and research that, that we could do so much easier today in a, in a world of like social media, you know, you know, social media scraping. And, you know, you don't, you don't need to be that, you don't need to be sneaky. It's all out there now. Yeah. But, you know, one of the, the things is I'm not sure whether um, kind of conventional intelligence organizations would put that high a priority on collecting that kind of information. They don't, and, they don't, they and, don't at all. And digesting it. Uh, I mean, that's, that's really the key thing. I mean, the, the British had such a large establishment uh, of people doing that kind of work during World War II that, you know, they had the resources for that as well as, you know, tracking U-boats and, um, and lots of other things. I was wondering, could you, and uh, alas, we're gonna run out of time, I was wondering if you could uh, comment on the extent to which you think um, Russia is, well, c compare how susceptible Nazi Germany and Putin's Russia are to these kinds of operations. Is Russia a harder target? I and mean, that's, a, again, a little term of art in the intelligence community, a hard target. Uh, but, th but they're thinking, of course, of hard targets in terms of ferreting out secrets by getting some spy in the Kremlin and communicating with them. That's, I mean, the way you're talking, it sounds like they're not that hard to target. So just actually finishing up, uh, reading some analysis, um, sort of a data fusion exercise, uh, that puts together sort of economic, social, um, and discursive analysis of what's going on in Russia. And it's very interesting because you get, I mean, you know, there's still polling going on in Russia, which I look at, but it's hard to really it's hard to be polling in a country that's, that's, you know, like Russia, which is so autocratic now. But this is more interesting because it shows you, you know, by comparing the economic data with the discursive data, you can see what the propaganda campaigns the Kremlin is doing. And then you match it to the economic data and go, well, you know, they're trying to get people to save. So there's a, a savings crisis in Russia. Nobody believes in the... <coughs> Nobody believes in the currency. So they're all taking out loans like crazy. Payday loans are shooting up. <clears throat> Personal debt is shooting up because everybody thinks the ruble is going to be worthless tomorrow. And the Kremlin's doing this nonstop propaganda saying, that, you know, ruble stronger than ever. No inflation. It's under control. And people don't believe it. 
And you can see like how they push it, push it, push it. You know, people start doing a little bit less debt and then it shoots up again. Um, so if you start contrasting the, you know, almost mythical propaganda, which I described in my first book, but, you know, I think, you know, there's a real risk that we over respect it sometimes. Um, and then what people are doing. And then sometimes what people are saying online, which you can do as well, um, you start to see all these cracks. There's cracks between different regions. You know, some regions have done very well out of the war. Uh, that's where the factories are that are churning out the weapons. Other regions, like the ones on the border with, with Western Europe, are doing terribly. So there's, if you were doing this properly, if you really wanted to start um, doing inventive public information campaigns, there are so many cracks and fissures. And what's interesting, it's where the Kremlin sees its greatest vulnerability. You know, they're actually, I think, wrong, but they think on the military side, because they have the sort of psychological escalation do dominance, all they have to do is go boo on the military side and, and the West will always kneel. They're not that worried about the economic side because they think they'll always have enough oil to feed, to feed their bodyguards and who cares about everyone else. What they're really worried about is the ideological side. There, they think they're really, really weak. That's why they pump so much money into it. They know it didn't work in the Soviet Union. They're worried it's not going to work again. They actually, they actually think that is their weak link. And it's the one we do the least on. But frankly, we're not doing very much. On, well, we're doing a lot on the economics, but not um, as economic, um, economic statecraft. We haven't really learned to leverage our economic power for security aims, which I think is the the phrase that I've been told to use because economic warfare is banned by the WTO <laughs> but, as, a, as a concept. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, frankly, in a 21st century, which is going to be a knife fight between various powers, we're going to have to relearn the arts of political and economic warfare. We really are. Or else we're just, because the other side, the Russians and the other rising authoritarian states, they only think like that. So if we don't start creating the institutions, the knowledge, and the path to efficacy in both political and economic, not even getting into military, we're going to lose. Um, we really are. And, um, you know, I hear so much like, oh, our sanctions aren't working. We haven't done the sanctions as a weapon yet. We just sort of push some sanctions out there and hope that it's a signal. That's not how you do sanctions in a time of war. So we really need to start reorientating a lot of things towards what is going to be a brutal 21st century. You know, just on, on, on that one, I'll, and then I'll, this will be my last comment. Uh, there's a lot to learn from World War II, which is, of course, one of the lessons from your book, including in economic warfare. I mean, the coercion that uh, the United States and Great Britain exercised against Spain and against Vichy France by controlling food going into those countries in order to get a political effect, namely keeping them out of war was, it, it was tough. It was very, very tough. And I, you know, I've always thought, I've never liked the term soft power, but one of the reasons why I don't like it is because people, when people talk about soft power, they're not actually thinking about using it like power, you know, which does mean thinking about how you use it to make somebody else really, really miserable. So uh, I'll, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> really miserable. <laughs> That's that difficult stuff. Look, and look, by the way, it's bloody hard because what is the counterbalance between, well, does that then mean that nobody else will, will ever do trade with you again? So there's so many, if this is not like, an, let's turn everything into a weapon. Ooh, no, it's really hard to sort of say, well, here's where it's being, we're going to weaponize it. Here we weren't, here are the rules, here's our doctrine. And, and it's, it's not easy. It's not easy at all to get all those balances right. Um, but you also kind of have to have the kind of, the awareness and also talking about information if we're talking something like, you know, sanctions plus subversion of military supplies. It's about having the institutions who do it. Um, I mean, let's, let's go right to the present. You know, I, I don't think there's very many people. Well, think about how the military approaches an operation and then think about how, I don't know, you know, Department of, you know, Department of Justice and OFAC approach sanctions. I mean, one has got this vast architecture of people and tools to get to effect. Well, the other one is barely thinking about effect. I mean, they're just thinking, oh, it's a bad thing. Let's sanction it. Fine. And, you know, 
and and I've seen I've been working a lot on on some of the sanction stuff. So so you see close up, you know, we sanction a we sanction a you know a tool that's making Russian weapons, you know, that's made in the West, and then we didn't do all the components, we didn't do all the oil for it, we didn't do all the propellants for it. You know, you, it's not the bloody machine that you need. You take out the whole chain, and that means a sanction here, a subversion here, buying somebody out here, you know, messing up this, you know, this supply chain of I don't know whatever chemical that they need from Tajikistan there. It's an operation. It's not like, you know, oh, we've sanctioned some guy on a list. It's the economic kill chain. Exactly, the kill chain thing. And and on the information side as well. So uh, my book is critical of, of a lot of what Delma did. This, this is not a like, oh, here's cut and paste and do. So many mistakes, so many disasters, so many disasters in the Cold War. Um, this is These are not easy lessons. But the fact is that at one point, the Brits went, okay, this is an existential fight. What is the role of information in this existential fight? Peter, uh, we are running out of time, but you know, Elliot mentioned uh, at the beginning of this podcast that uh, you touch on, uh, of course, Russia and Putin, uh, as well as the lessons from World War II, but also uh, the, the problems of the big lie in the United States and uh, the role that... Uh, Trump has played. I made reference to Steve Bannon earlier. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, we had um, Liz Cheney on as a guest talking about her efforts and the efforts of the January 6th committee to debunk the big lie and try and um, uh, try and combat it among a very large percentage of Republicans who believe it. How should we think about you know, these information operations in in a domestic U.S. context of how do we drain the poison uh, that's being poured into our political system out of it? And, and uh, inter alia, I have to just make the comment that you touch glancingly on William Joyce, uh, you know, um, affectionately known as Lord Ha Ha, um, who broadcast uh, a, a British fascist who defected to Germany and broadcast from Berlin attacking um, uh, British society. I, I I was thinking about that as I watched the Tucker Carlson uh, broadcasts from you know a Carrefour uh, shopping uh, center in Moscow and uh, the Kievsky Vogzal when he was you know out or it was I guess it was the Kiev Kievsky Kievsky metro station that he was outside of. Uh, how do we how do we combat this at home? I mean, I have been surprised. I've only been in America two years, and because of the war in Ukraine, I've, I've been going. You know, I've been spending a lot of my attention is is, is on Eastern, Eastern Europe. So, and, and I'm always reluctant to make sort of big sweeping generalizations. Actually, no, that's a lie. I'm a journalist. I do it all the time. But um, <laughs> but but about things that I, I just I'm only just starting to look at. What I've been very surprised by in the U.S. is, despite you know 2016 being eight years ago there hasn't been this huge push to essentially um, split the, in a good way, but really sort of like differentiate the, I don't know, hard MAGA audience, which probably you can't reach and shouldn't even bother, to with all the other softer bits. Now, Biden's trying to do that in his election. You know, Nikki Haley voters come to me. But... I would assume that there should have been a huge media push if we really want to preserve democracy. It's not just about feeling virtuous. It's about creating a public sphere where diverse groups of society can, in a very, by the way, I don't mind the word polarizing, in a very polarizing way, interact with each other. That's democracy. It's, it's, it's messy, but we're talking to each other. And, you know, I'm, I'm sort of surprised that, that no one's, we're invested into that. Now, I don't idealize the BBC in any way, but it was very interesting. After Brexit, when we realized we had a similar issue with people living just in different worlds, the first thing the BBC does is move a ton of its people and offices to the north of the country um, because they realized they have become out of touch. So it would be the equivalent of, I don't know, CNN going, oh my God, we really are out of touch. And putting loads of its effort into, you know, having offices and having newsrooms in throughout flyover states. That's what should have happened. And it's not as it happened overnight. It's not like, ha here's a little info op, you know. 
Delman was like, you know, he was running a mainstream media. You know, if, if it was, if his radios, which the assessed themselves said were among the top three in Munich, that's, he was like a, a, a broadcaster as big as MSNBC, CNN, Delma, Delmaren, you know, it would have been that sort of size of, of media. We, we have to understand he wasn't running little kind of psyops. He was doing cultural change. Um, and I'm kind of surprised no one's done that here. I, I, I know there's been investment into local media as a way to wean people off, you know, the really, you know, aggressive propaganda media and, and maybe local media can play a role, but and I, I'm not against that. But there's so many cool innovations in America on the micro level, but no one scaled them. Um, I was kind of surprised by it because, you know, everyone's been worried about this since 2016, but no one's done the sort of massive, and it is massive, investment to do something about it. Um, the BBC in Britain emerged in the um, in the sort of in the 20s and 30s in a very similar situation. There was a massive polarization through the press in England, through the tabloids. There was a sense that Hitler and Stalin had learned how to use radio better than democracies. Um, and the guy who created the BBC, Lord Reith, talked about it as creating the agora of old, the market square of old, where people could gather and, and be part of one national, robust discussion. Now, I don't think you can have the BBC here. I know that's a very British institution. I, I don't think you can cut and paste it. But whether it's civic media, whether it's private, that, that doesn't really matter. It means getting up in the morning and thinking how you do that. How do I reach those audiences and bring them into a conversation with the others? And again, this is not about the middle. People come to go, oh, we need the middle. It's like, no, it's not about the middle. It's about diversity, but balancing diversity with, with, with dialogue. And again, it's not about being nice to fascists. You know, the, let the fascists stew in their 14%. You know, you know, that's probably where most countries end up with. That's the amount of sort of very, very sort of, you know, deeply committed to supremacism populations people have. But you've got to start working with the rest. But that means working with them. That doesn't, it's not an overnight thing. You don't do it just before an election. You do it for years and decades. But anyway, as I said, I was surprised. You know, I've only been here a couple of years. My research focus hasn't been fully to do with the US yet, and I'm only starting to see some research now. Um, and I'd like to think that there's hope. Um, I can't give up in America. Um, you said at the start I was born in, well, I was born in Kiev in Ukraine. And as, even though my parents ended up in, in the UK, I suppose I am so deeply interpolated with the story that however bad things are in Eastern Europe, there's always an America that you can head to, which will value freedom and rights. And I'm not ready to give up on it quite yet. Neither are we. So, Neither are we. So uh, thank yeah. you, Peter. You've been a terrific guest. Uh, the book is How to Win an Information War, The Propaganda to Outwitted Hitler by Peter Pomerantsev, who been our guest. Peter, thank you for joining us on Shield of the Republic. I hope we can have you back again. And once you've solved the conundrum of America, we can we can discuss that book. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, too, I just, yeah, I, yes, well, I can solve it. I hope it's not one of these tragic ones where you like, you solve something as it <laughs> dissipates in front of you. You're like, aha, I get it now. <laughs> it's like, it disappears over the cliff. I don't know. I I really don't understand. And I've had so many stories about, you know, this is not being recorded now. Is, are we still recording? Yeah, we're still recording. Oh, okay, then I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, no, I just know there were so many thoughts over the last, even over the last three or four years to create big, big media projects to start to integrate more people into a common dialogue. And they always broke down. And, you know, some of the richest men in America were ready to do it. And, you know, and it always breaks down. I'm like, and now you're worrying again that 30% of the nation lives in an alternative reality. I mean, you've got to do something about it. You can't just like, I mean, I, I love, you know, it's, it's, it takes, it takes really big investment. These are structural things, you know, these are not projects. These are like really sort of investing in sort of reorientating things. But, nah, I don't know. Well, let's hope, let's hope they listen to you, Peter. 